on that. Hey, yay! Today we're going to be talking about how to learn about writing from other media. Um, now, I'm going to clarify at the beginning um, something that I want to make clear. The best way to learn about writing is from books because of the fact that then you are reading someone else's writing, therefore you can learn more about writing because you are reading writing. That was a lot of reading and writings in one sentence, but hopefully that made it more clear. Um, I think it is best stated though by Stephen King. I actually found this quote the other day and was like, yes, this is perfect for the lesson. Um, if you don't have time to read, you don't have the time or the tools to write. I loved the fact that he emphasized or the tools because of the fact that reading gives you the tools to write better. Now, what I want to clarify with this quote is it doesn't mean you have to write, it doesn't mean you have to read every day, it doesn't mean you have to read every week, it doesn't even have to mean you have to read like 20 books in a month. All I'm saying is read at least one book every other month. That's the bare minimum in order to keep your skills sharp. If you, the best way to, I describe it I guess is a metaphor. <laughs> Unfortunately, I work in a lot of metaphors. If this doesn't work for you, I'm sorry. A chef wouldn't work with dull knives. They just wouldn't. And a carpenter wouldn't work with a broken hammer. They just wouldn't. And it's the same thing with writing. You don't work with a broken hammer. You don't work with dull knives. You've got to work with your equipment sharp and clean and crisp and up to date, which means that you have to read decently frequently. Now I understand school's busy. Life is busy. Heck, I've had a really hard time getting my own amount of reading in. But as long as you're completing one book every other month to every three months, I would say you're on a good track. You don't have to be reading 20 books in a month in order to have amazing writing skills. But you do need to read. Period. However, I know we don't always have the time for reading and I know that people love other forms of media. So we're going to talk about other forms of media aside from books today, but we're going to talk about books first. Because as I said, books are definitely your primary thing. Now, first thing you're going to want to pay attention to is word choice. Now this might seem weird because with word choice it seems kind of like why would you pick word choice out of all the things you could learn from a book? We're going to talk about more. But the reason I talk about word choice first is because of the fact that word choice affects your writing. If you're describing the scenery as dark and drab and then you have it be a super happy comedic book, people are going to be so confused. But if you have the scenery as dark and drab and then all of a sudden you have a murder, the tone fits. <laughs> so word choice helps to set the tone of the writing. It also can sometimes help to give a little extra tone to your sentences if you want to, if you want to go sentence level, if you want to be like, hey, their heart's pounding in their chest, so I'm going to use more emphasized short words, that definitely can work. If you want to do it like they're elegant and flowy like a beautiful long ball gown, you can have a big, elegant, long, flowy sentence with elegant, long, flowy words. <laughs> your word choice is actually going to affect how the writing comes off. If you feel like a scene has been really well described to you, go back, reread it, see what words they chose. See why you think they chose those words. Try substituting a few words even and say, hey, if they, re if they chose this word instead of this word, how would that change how this scene feels? That can really help you to develop more of an idea of what words you want to use. All right. <clears throat> Next thing. Formatting. Books can teach you how to actually format your novel. Um, formatting is actually really important, especially if you want to get published, indie, or traditional. If your for formatting is absolutely atrocious, you will either get A, rejected by potential traditional publishers, or B, rejected by your readers because they'll pick up your book, interested in your concept, and then go, ah, at the formatting and run away. <laughs> formatting actually is really jarring for people. We love our traditional book formatting. Now that is one thing I will say, not all indie books follow proper formatting. Um, so what I'd recommend is if you notice a book that you feel like, I don't know why, but I hate the way this page is done, Take a traditionally published book, put them together, and then look at them. Now, that's not to say indie books are bad. I'm all for indie books. There are lots of indie books that I, that I have helped publish, 
in the regard that I've helped edit them, and books that I've read that are independently published, that the formatting is mwah, gorgeous. But I will say, if the formatting's off, it's likely more, more likely to be an indie book because of the fact that traditional is expected to have that as their standard, whereas indie is not expected that. The writers should do that, but they're not expected to because no one's watching over their shoulder making sure they do. Long story short, make sure when you're reading books you pay attention to the formatting, especially because whatever kind of book it is, if you're writing the same kind of book, you're going to want the same kind of formatting. Um, pay attention to how dialogue is formatted. Pay attention to how paragraphs work. Pay attention to when tabs are used and when tabs aren't used. Pay attention to how they differentiate time skips. These are all very important things. Um, if you guys are struggling with formatting though, I do have a formatting document that's written as if like the narrator's talking to you about how to format your novel. So if that's a struggle for you at all, just comment down below um, and, um, or, and or shoot me an email. Um, I, uh, here, C-I-N-G-A-L-L-S at American Fork. Yeah. If you are curious in my formatting um, documents, wow, you really can't read that purple on the video screen. That's annoying. <laughs> Do I have a black back here? No, all I have is orange, red, and pink. All right, purple's the best we got. Um, <laughs> anyway, long story short, if you want that formatting help little document, send me an email, say, hey, I want the formatting document, and I will send you the formatting document to help you. I hope you find it funny. I found it funny to write. All right, but you can learn for free by just reading books and observing how they work. <laughs> All right, next thing is what bothers you? Now this goes for a lot of other media too, but this is gonna be more important for writing, um, for reading books because that is going to affect your writing. Notice what you don't like figure out why it's bothering you, and then write down a list of things that you would like to avoid in your writing. If there are things that you're just like, oh my gosh, I, ah, like this is too cheesy, this is too cliche, this is bothering me, this character's super annoying, figure out why. Don't just say, like, like you were saying earlier, this bugs me, <laughs> or I don't like this. Say why. Figure out why you don't like it. If it's because they're too sarcastic for you, maybe say, okay, my characters won't be sarcastic. Some people love sarcasm, but if you don't, that's fine. Then there are other people who are like, this is too cheesy. What makes it cheesy? What about it is bad? Is it the pacing? Sometimes I've found a lot of things when they're too cheesy, it's either because they're unrealistic or they are too quickly paced. They just race through stuff that they shouldn't race through. Um, those are common culprits, but that doesn't mean that's always the culprit. So find out what is bothering you about it. Don't just be like, oh, it bothers me and throw it away. Actually read books that bother you. Why? Because you can actually learn a lot from books that bother you, because then you can say, this is something I will never do now. <laughs> it's important to learn about what things you should and shouldn't do, not just the things you should do. All right, um, next thing, all right. We kind of already mentioned this, but I want to dive deeper. Read what you like and what you dislike. Because yes, you can learn what you like from what you read, and you're like, hey, this paragraph's gorgeous, and then you learn about word choice, or hey, this paragraph is really, really neat, or what makes this particular moment super fulfilling for me? Is it because the characters got finally got together and the pacing was just right, and so that you know final moment is like, yeah, like you're cheering them on, or is it like, what what is it about it that makes the book so likable? Another thing you should do though is read things you dislike. For example, um, I know a lot of people who hate lots of best-selling books. There are lots of best-selling books that are amazingly popular, right? And yet other people dislike them. <laughs> so if you dislike a best-selling book, especially a best-selling book, I would encourage you to figure out what is good about the thing you're reading. Because even if you hate it, even if you dislike it, there's got to be some good to gain out of it. Because otherwise it would not be a best-selling novel. 
if it truly was as awful <laughs> as you feel it is, it wouldn't be best selling, which means there has to be some redeeming quality, even if it's minute and tiny <laughs> in your opinion. Find that tiny little sliver of what is redeeming about this novel, what makes it interesting, what makes people like it. Even if you disagree and you're like, well, what makes people like it is the fact that they're kissing all the time and you're like, I don't like that. That's fine. <laughs> but at least you know now, people like when characters kiss who are in love. That's fine. You don't have to do that. But at least you're aware of what people like. Because if you're aware of what people like, you can be aware of how to do it in a way that people will like in your own writing. Hello. <laughs> so, to recap, read what you like to learn more from it, but also read what you dislike, because even if you hate it, there's something to be learned from it, whether it's what not to do, or whether it's that tiny little sliver of here's why it's popular, even if I don't like it. Because it's popular for a reason, even if you hate it. <laughs> there's a lot of books out there that people hate, and yet they're like, but so many other people like it. So find out why. That's important to find out why. All right. So one thing is to also make sure why you love it. So if you do read things that you love, why? Why do you love it? Is it because it's comedic? Is it because it's funny? Is it because it feels genuine? If so, what makes it feel genuine and something else feel cheesy? I actually did this the other day where my husband and I watched two romance movies back to back because we had some a little extra time. One was super good, and we were like, oh, that was so sweet. And the next one, we were like, oh, that was terrible. <laughs> and watching those back to back actually helped me realize what made one terrible and what made one good. Um, so sometimes it can be beneficial, too, to figure out why you love things, why things are good, why things are, what makes them tick, what makes them really pop, what makes you feel like you can't stop reading. What makes you just not want to put the book down? Write those things down and do them. <laughs> because if it makes you not want to put the book down, it's probably going to make your reader not want to put the book down. So do that thing. <laughs> All right. Now, speaking of learning from movies, <laughs> we're going to be talking about, and as I'm going to reiterate, if you aren't writing, um, if you aren't writing for movies, if you aren't writing for screenplays, TV shows, etc., because there are people who write for these things, obviously. That's how they get written. That's how they get produced. <laughs> so if you are going to become a TV show, movie writer, video game writer, what have you, by all means, study these to your heart's content. But if you are trying to write a novel, because most of you are here for novels, um, <laughs> then I would say books are your first source of here's what I should do and shouldn't do, here's how I'd learn. However, that doesn't mean that you can't learn from movies, plays, TV shows, and video games. And I'm gonna tell you some things that you can learn from those individual aspects. But just keep in mind that you wanna have it be books first if you're writing books, movies first if you're writing movies, etc. All right, so next we're gonna talk about movies. Because who doesn't love a good movie? <laughs> Unless it's a book adaptation gone horribly wrong. In which case we all cry. But that's fine. Um, <laughs> oh, that's not a good movie. <laughs> exactly. That's fair. Fair. Good point. Then we can learn here's why they sucked. Yeah. Here's what <laughs> not to do. Cop, cop, game. <laughs> which is so sad because that was honestly the best contract he had. Yeah. He said he'd gone through like 90 contracts and everyone else was like worse. And he's like, this is just the best of all the ones that suck. Yeah. And like, they're rich in the story. They're like, Great. Yeah. And has that respectable storytelling. But but like it's not energy. It's not the same. Yeah, and what makes it not the same? What makes you like it less? What makes you like it more? Yeah, that, exactly. that, yeah like it's good to, especially it's good to compare when they're not the same at all. Mm -hmm. Um, for example, How to Train Your Dragon. Books, movies, not even close. <laughs> the only thing that's similar is Toothless and Hiccup, and those are just their names. Not mm -hmm. even necessarily what they look like. <laughs> Um, so I adore the movies. I know, they're I do too. Favorite, favorite and I adore genre. the books too, but they're completely different beasts. Yeah, I've actually never read the books because <laughs> I, I don't want like, oh, I, cause I have a massive <laughs> reading list. <laughs> That's fair. See, for me, I've actually read the books and I've read, and I've watched, read the movies, watched the movies, 
and they're two separately different stories but the main reason why I think they couldn't do it on screen is because it wouldn't have played well mm -hmm. um, after reading the books I was like this just is not easily made into a movie unless you just change the whole thing which is what they did so yeah. they honestly they kept the heart of it the sole stone of the novel but everything else had to change because it wouldn't have cinematically worked. It wasn't very cinematically done, which is why learning from movies can actually be very beneficial for you because then your movie adaptations, pray to God that they happen one day, are good. <laughs> yeah, right. And I think if you're doing a movie adaptation, you want to focus more on the emotion that the mm -hmm. books convey than that comes to like details. Yes. Because um, that's how you get a good book movie adaptation. Details, yes, details are super crucial, super important, mm -hmm. and you need to listen to your author person. Mm -hmm. But that's and okay. Like Shyamalan. <laughs> Freaking Avatar The Lost Airbender. Anyway, oh, <laughs> that was terrible. Anyway, all right, so going back to the original <laughs> topic. Um, a great thing that you can learn from movies is the show don't tell principle. You can learn this from books, but some people don't know what this means in a book. And sometimes when you're reading it, you can't even tell whether or not they're showing or telling because of the fact that you don't know how to identify it always. Now, I've done lessons about this before, so if you struggle with identifying show versus tell or don't know what it is, please switch over to that video and then come back. Um, <laughs> so, if it seems like it could be a villain monologue or something <laughs> equally boring, it's telling. Scrap it! No, for sure. Text, if it sounds like a textbook, if it sounds like a villain monologue and a cheesy <laughs> 50s movie, probably needs to be scrapped. Um, the, it's telling. The, the, the new Avatar live action series, <laughs> my friends and I yeah. were watching and were like, oh, the telling! And you're like, ah! Oh! <laughs> Screams! No, yeah, because honestly, I... Anyway, <laughs> it's fine. Alright, no, and then we'll just, I'll just shoot from my face. Um, <laughs> so, things you can learn from movies is how to show and not tell most of the time. Some movies are really bad at this, but those movies you'll notice do well. That's why they suck, is because they do telling. Really, really, really good movies show. Mm -hmm. Don't tell. And so, like, what do they show? How do they show that the guy has a crush on the girl? They don't say, he has a crush on Sally. They show him blushing, right? They show oh. him being like, I, I, just, just, uh, words, I'll just take your books. Staring at them <laughs> Yes, they're staring at them from across the classroom and then getting hit in the face with a paper spit walk. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely dread whenever their friends talk about her. Exactly. Those are ways you can show those things instead yeah. of just saying, he has a crush on her. Because that's boring. <laughs> that's boring. No one likes it. <laughs> and so movies can absolutely, good movies, again to clarify, are a great way to learn about how to show things especially because with movies, they don't generally have a narrator. And if they do have a narrator, that is something else you can learn. Good narrating. Because of the fact that if the narrating is bad, the movie flops, right? Yeah. But you can have a book narrator, right? You can have a narrator telling you things and still have it be enjoyable, but you have to do it right. Yeah, like Bedtime Stories is a yeah. great example of it. Bedtime Stories is a fantastic it's so example. Cute. Oh my I know, gosh. right? That's so cute. And then National Treasure, the beginning oh, bit, is yeah. a great example because his grandfather's telling him this epic story. We're seeing it unfold, right? Yeah. It's, it's epic. Um, those are good examples of great narration in movies. If you watch a movie and you're like, oh, this narrator is the worst, just stop talking, that's how to learn how not to narrate. <laughs> <laughs> it, however, if you're watching a movie and you're, it's like Bedtime Stories or it's like, um, the beginning of National uh, Old Treasure, and you're going, yeah, this is cool. Write down what made it cool, what made it not cool, what made you invested in that story, even though they were telling you exactly what was happening as it was unfolding on the screen, yeah. right? If your <laughs> story can like do without a narration, and people would like still understand what's going on, yeah. But the narration just makes it so much better. Oh, for go sure. For it. For sure. Please go for it. Narrators can be so much fun. But, yeah, but like if they can't live without, because then the readers don't know what's happening, yeah. then you have a problem. Then it's a problem. You can't become dependent on the narration. The narration, yeah. the narration should be like good, good spice in a mm -hmm. soup or in a taco or something like that. You know, like when you have tacos, you're generally like, this is enjoyable. But if you put too many jalapenos on your taco, you're going to die of spice. Yeah. <laughs> and it's the same thing with narrative. You should add it as a nice spicy. Yeah, a little, a little bit of salt. Yeah, a little bit of salt, a little bit of jalapenos, never hurt anyone. But like, 
just dumping the whole jar of jalapenos on your taco is going to kill you. <laughs> That's a problem. All right. So next thing that I'm actually going to talk about is color palette <gasps> with movies. <laughs> Yes, color and stories can be super evocative of certain things. For example, a great, um, a great thing that I learned actually from the second movie of Harry Potter was color palette. And I didn't know this at the time until I watched the um, bonus features on the second movie. And on the second movie, they talked about how the fact how they were like, a lot of people were upset that, uh, idiot, Professor Lockhart. <laughs> the dumb one. Um, he, he, how they, a lot of people were upset how he was described in the book as wearing lots of pastels and bright colors, and yet in the books he didn't wear as bright of colors. They were more muted and more like dusty colors instead of being like bright pastels. The reason this is acceptable, and they explained it in the movie, is because the rest of the setting was so dark because they wanted to portray and foreshadow the darkness of the coming serpent. And so in order to have this very bright, flashy person in this very dark castle, it actually looked weird. It actually felt wrong. And so they were like, hey, this would actually t um, give better connotation for the story and fit better with the setting if we have a slightly more dusky color palette. And I agree, it worked beautifully. Once I rewatched it, I was like, I totally can't imagine him in pastels now because it wouldn't have fit. Um, and so that's something you can learn from movies to put in your books, is that if the content of your book is darker, maybe consider a darker color palette. If the content of your book is comedic and light and fun, maybe consider a brighter color palette. Yeah, shy away from a lot of gray and black. Gray and black, unless you're doing horror or like spooky. <laughs> In which case, gray and black is acceptable, but I agree. Otherwise, generally shy away. Yeah. <laughs> generally, gray and black is not good except for in gothic and horror and spooky. Yeah, another good example <laughs> of using color is the Cross mm -hmm. Spider Verse. Mm, exactly, yes. I would really impressed <laughs> Yes, I would highly recommend if there's a movie you can learn about color palettes from, go watch Into the Spider Verse, especially the second one. Mm -hmm. Because the second one, they even go it's so more good. in depth. Like the first one, they used color palettes, but the second one, like, mwah, just all the colors. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to learn about how to use color, that is definitely a great example of that in movies. All right, the next one is setting. Now this is similar to color palette, but not the same. Um, with setting, you may notice in movies that the setting looks darker and scarier if the movie's darker and scarier, and that it looks more bright and sunshiny if it's bright and sunshiny. Similar to the color palette, but not the same. The difference here is that one is using specific colors, the other is using the actual place itself. What makes something scary? If you're in a library like this, this feels nice, right? This feels cozy. But what could you do and change to make it feel creepy and okay. dark? Repainting the walls. <laughs> Repaint the walls. There you go. Um, or alter the come up with lines in the windows. Yes, I was going to say, or alternatively have peeling paint on the walls. Yeah. <laughs> um, hang on. Any, any other thing. ideas for how to make something spooky? Oh, take care of like, all of the colorful decor. Mm, yes. Like, this is a real colorful library. It is very colorful. We need to make um, it more drab if we were to make it spooky. And then kind of just like that book jackets or like replacing everything mm. with like leather books. Yes, those old and leather everything. tomes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and then like Spider-Man to a classic, maybe a little overdone, mm. but... But in, in proper situations, you know, it makes yeah. sense logi logistically. That's why they're yeah. done so often. But yeah, exactly. Um, dust. <laughs> dust, um, yes. With Very this common. particular library, it has like the tile ceilings. You could like just punch a couple of them out, have like Ooh. wires hanging it down. Yes, the hanging down wires is another good one. I'm going to stop ranting. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Thank you for the yeah. excellent example. <laughs> um, see, and that was the thing. You didn't mention color really at all. You only mentioned color twice. Most of that was just how to change the setting itself, not about color. So color and setting are similar. They're adjacent. You could go like this, but they are not the same thing. Um, your setting can be creepy and still have a bright color palette. Um, and that would make it that actually very interesting. I don't know what that would look like. Um, <laughs> but long story short, that is some, those are some various things you can learn about writing from movies. Again, books are first. Always reading is the best way to learn, but we got to learn from other media too, right? Because we can't just spend all day reading, even if sometimes we want to.
Today, you can tell I that. that I didn't sleep. <laughs> engagement. I think it's also because my notes say engaged, and then I was trying to write engagement, and that didn't work out too well. <laughs> my brain's like, why is there not a second G? Well, because it's a different ending on the word. Anyway, all right. <laughs> so, with please, something you can learn is audience engagement. Yes, movies engage the audience. Yes, TV shows engage the audience, but plays are a whole new level. Because obviously the audience is live. And they are live on stage, which means that they have to engage the audience even more than yeah. if it was a movie or a TV show. Because with a movie or a TV show, they can pause it, they can come back, they can purchase the movie, and then you don't have to worry about it. However, audience engagement is crucial with plays because they won't even buy a ticket if they don't know they'll be engaged. Yeah, <laughs> and so as a result of that, you need to make sure that the audience engagement is high. You need to make sure that they are intrigued by what they're seeing, that they are locked onto that screen. And there are a lot of different ways that plays do that. That's why I have a general yeah. overarching category. Again, with the um, high school, mm -hmm. is they'll kind of, they'll kind of shatter the fourth wall a little bit. <laughs> that, is, that can um, be fun, for sure, especially for plays. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Because um, in the musical, there was mm -hmm. a couple, there was a scene where the ensemble would go out into the house of the audience for you mm -hmm. guys who aren't stage crew nerds and stuff. Um, they'll come out into the house and they'll ask people for bids on um, an auction that people were doing on the play. And that was fun. Mm -hmm. um, there was also, I think there was a character like planted in the audience to kind of interact mm -hmm. with the narrative that they had for one of the plays. Nice. And it was fantastic. Also at the junior high, they did a Peter Pan play, mm -hmm. and it was kind of dependent on the audience and how loud they clapped um, um, for one of the characters to survive. And so oh, great. Nice, nice. Yeah. See, there you go. That can help engage your audience. With, um, with writing, the fourth wall breaking and engaging with your audience in that regard, um, you can do it in multiple different ways. Either you can break the fourth wall. I will say, if you do break the fourth wall, do it well, please. Do it, yes, A, do it well, and please B, do, well. do it consistently. Don't yeah. just do it once randomly in the middle of the story. That feels weird. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing it all the time, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> but if it's just once randomly at the very end, you're like, what the heck? Yeah. <laughs> it feels weird. Um, also, make sure you do it well. Don't be cheesy about it. And when I say cheesy, I would say things that are dependent on actual audience interaction, only because of the fact that with a play that works really well, but with a book that doesn't work as well generally, unless it's a kid's book. In which case, by all means, feel free to tell them to clap their hands and spin around in circles five times. Um, <laughs> that being said, um, to explain fourth wall breaking, an example of fourth wall breaking is when you're talking at the character. Now you can break the fourth wall lightly without breaking it directly. Um, breaking it directly is like, you know, this story is getting really boring. Why don't I tell you something else? 
that's directly breaking the fourth wall. However, you can break the fourth wall secondarily and have it be a little bit more subtle in ways where you narrate it and they're like, man, this was the worst part of the story. That's semi-breaking the fourth wall, but you're not talking to the reader, so it's not a direct fourth wall break. It's more like a fourth wall stab. <laughs> you're just bumping the fourth wall. <laughs> like, oh, see, one of the characters got angry and decided to punch a hole in the fourth yeah, but just, wall. Yeah, see that? <laughs> and then you have fourth wall breaking where you literally just like, and it shatters <laughs> on the ground. <laughs> Those are two sword, different like, kinds. I'm sure you've noticed this is, in fact, the second time I've died. <laughs> that, that's a quote in one of my books, and huh, it's great. It's funny, it. though. It, it's funny, too, because different characters can do it differently. I know that there was someone who I'm working with right now. I worked with her first book in a um, series, and she said for the second series, one of the characters is actually going to start breaking the fourth wall, but that's just because that's his personality. <laughs> and I was like, I love this. That's but, amazing. Like, yes. Because the, first, uh, because the first character of the first book is primarily this, like, Victorian age immortal and so like yes she's living in the modern times but she's very like prim and proper and elegant and meanwhile this other guy's like nine and he's you like <laughs> he's just like ha who cares about the story anyway <laughs> he's a terror but that's why we love him um <laughs> all right <That's> me. <laughs> all right so I'm better one thing that you can learn from is time skips as well. How much time do they skip and how do they make sure it's fluid and you know the time is skipping aside from just a scene change? Because yes, a scene can change can indicate a time skip, but it can also just indicate this is two seconds later in a field because they were just in town, right? <laughs> so it's important with plays that you differentiate what is a time skip and what is just them going from point A to point B. Um, and they do this very well because they have to make sure it's clear. If you don't know where the heck the characters are or when they are, that's a problem. <laughs> you need to make sure that's clear. And plays do an excellent job of this. Um, another thing is dialogue. Dialogue in plays is always super strong. Why? Because they have little to no props to work with 90% of the time. Even big fat Broadway plays that have millions of dollars worth of budget have very few props to work with, right? Because you just can't do as much and have lots of scene changes, right? Unless you have one story taking place in one house the entire time, you're going to be changing sets frequently, which means your props are going to be limited. That means your dialogue has to punch them in the face with power because the props can't. So dialogue, making your dialogue super strong, learning from plays about how to have popping, amazing dialogue, by all means, please go watch a play and notice what dialogue is your favorite. Write down your favorite dialogue lines and then say, hey, this is why it's my favorite. That'll help you learn more about dialogue. All right. <laughs> they are so great. Right. I was going to say like a good play. That's fair. Again, so if it's this like is some like little elementary school play that you're going purely because your kid is in it. That's <laughs> I I will say with with plays, just like with anything else, just like with all the things we're going to be talking about today, there's good and bad examples, and you can learn just as much from the bad, in my opinion, because then you can say this is what not to do. Yeah. And learning what not to do is just as important. What to do is first, you watch the Adam Part of the Last Airbender series and you <laughs> And adore. then you, you watch it. the M. Night Shyamalan. I'm sorry, M. Night Shyamalan, but that was just so bad. Yeah, you watch the movie and you hate it and you want to burn it, but you know what not to do. You know what not to do now. Yeah, seriously though, M. Night Shyamalan like, has so many amazing movies, but that is just not one of them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if you're looking for a good M. Night Shyamalan movie, um, the best one I've seen from him is The Sixth Sense. Fair. Very good. Definitely recommended. Don't watch that there, Benny. <laughs> Just don't. It was actually hilarious. My um, earth science teacher, I mentioned, I was like, yeah, that movie sucked. And he's like, what movie? <laughs> like, we don't acknowledge it here. <laughs> it's not it's not worthy of acknowledgement. I thought it was amazing. And he's like, no, nah, yeah, honestly, I can't acknowledge it existed because he was, like, so pumped for it that he, like, even made T-shirts for him and his friends, and they, like, bought tickets, and then they left, and they were just, like, pissed. Yeah, <laughs> I was just like, 
I'm so sad. And so as a result, he's just like, it just doesn't exist. It never happened. Yeah. <laughs> what, are you talking about a different canonical universe? This multiverse doesn't have that. Um, <laughs> but anyway, all right, next we're gonna be talking about TV shows. <gasps> the Chosen. I One mean, thing what? that you can learn from TV shows is <laughs> chapters and short stories. So, TV shows tend to have an overarching plot that then has a bunch of mini plots, right? That's why oftentimes they can be comparable to a chapter. Now, the difference is with chapters, you can sometimes end in the middle, you can sometimes end partway through, you know, different or things like that. Or you can pull a really fire and then end on a cliffhanger. Yes, or you can end on a cliffhanger. You can do that with TV shows, but TV shows tend to wrap up the plot 90% of the time and then have very few, like, to be continued episodes, right? Yeah. Um, so it's a great way to learn short I'm stories, too. too. And I'm mad because by then it's 8 o'clock and I have to go to bed because it's a school night. Mood. I mean, what? <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel that. Um, so honestly, this is a great way to learn how to write compelling chapters that lead to an overarching plot because of the fact that they do it very well. Um, another thing that you can learn, though, about from TV shows is how to do short stories well. Because like I said, 90% of their episodes will be wrapped up by the end. Mm -hmm. Sure, they might have a little Phineas hint of like, here's what goes tomorrow. Great example. Mm -hmm. Phineas and Ferb, we've got Bluey. Yep. I love Bluey. <laughs> there's so many good so ones. So many good ones. No, for sure. There's so many good TV shows where like it wraps it up by the end, but you still want more because you love the characters. Yeah. You love the plot. You love the way it's going. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not any less a short story. So if you're having trouble with your short story writing and finding that it's either becoming too long or too short, watch a TV show. See what they do to help keep it poppin' and interesting, but also not too dragging. Yeah. yeah. Alright, next thing that you can learn from TV shows. Life that, it's long enough. that is fair. It's not like they are, they are always hoping, because it's boring. What makes a series bad? TV shows are a great way to learn this because of the fact that there are a lot of TV shows that go from being like thousands of viewers, amazing, to like the next season they're like, he's an alien, and you're like, what? It was all a dream. <laughs> exactly, or it's all a dream and you lose like a thousand viewers. So you can also learn what makes series bad too. If you notice there's a TV show that you're like, this has almost no one who says they like it. I should watch it. And you should, not only because it's fun to make fun of bad TV shows, um, <laughs> but also because in the process of making fun of it, you can be like, hey, here's why it sucks. Here's what I won't do. And here's what I <laughs> shall never do ever. <laughs> and it's important, again, it's important to learn what not to do. Yes, it's important to learn what to do, but it's also imper important to learn what to avoid, because if you never learn what to avoid, you risk doing it yourself. <laughs> so. I highly encourage you to find a TV show that sucks and watch it and mock it highly <laughs> um, while watching. <laughs> it's fun. All right, last thing that we're going to talk about today is video games. How can you learn about writing from video games? Um, funnily enough, there actually is a career called video game writer, um, and that's because truly good, well-written video games have actual writers behind them. For example, um, Neil Gaiman actually has written for several different video games. And yet he's also a novelist. It's because it takes similar skills. What? He is, he's a really good writer, that's my point. He's a fantastic writer. It's not, you're not any less of a writer just because you write for video games. If anything, in some ways it's harder because you write the whole plot and then someone else is in charge of actually producing the dang thing. <laughs> so in some ways it's scarier because you're like, here's my baby, don't kill it. <laughs> but, um, so one thing that this is great to learn is try and fail cycles. The reason why is because obviously since someone is playing the game, they're gonna be trying and failing at this game, right? If you are feeling like a game is really, really frustrating you, that officially means you've had too many of these. However, if you feel like a game is too easy, you've had too few. You need to learn what the right amount of trying and failing is. It's important. It's actually kind of crucial to writing. In general, it is very crucial to writing, in my personal opinion, but others would disagree. Um, <laughs> I 
I don't know why people disagree with that, but whatever. We'll get on that topic another day. Um, <laughs> so with try-fail cycles, I would highly encourage you to count how many times you've tried and failed in a video game and how much equals too easy and how much equals angry <laughs> and just like throws the controller across the room. <laughs> so, yeah, but you're a special case. <laughs> and the reason why is because of the fact that you want to make sure you don't have so many trial fail cycles that the reader becomes frustrated and is like, well, I guess they just suck. But you also don't want to have them have so few try fail cycles that they're just like, I'm a genius. Marty <laughs> Sue. That's when you get the Marty Sue really soon. Like, mm, don't do that. Nope. No. <laughs> <laughs> this is why it's important. Superman is no longer popular. Yeah. It's that because mm. they're not the best at making movies, but that's a different story. Yeah. But also on top of that, it's just purely because of the fact that, well, he needed some try fail cycles, which he didn't ever get. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, as a result. He's um, like an alien with so many powers, and the only thing that can defeat him is this itty bitty little weird type of rock. Like, what the crap? That's why Stanley is so much better. Dude, we love Stanley. He's the best. All right. No, Next you're thing. not. You are not <laughs> Stanley. Shut up. <laughs> so I'm his little lock. Yes, but you keep comparing yourself to Stanley and he's obnoxious. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jokingly. So, he with video know. games, one thing that you can also learn is fighting versus storytelling. What is the good balance? Because some video games have so much fighting that there's basically no story. Then there's other video games that have so much story, there's basically no actual fighting slash action, right? So, what is a good balance? What are video games that you like and why do you like them? Why? I should move the plot ahead. <laughs> exactly, they should move the plot ahead. Or if it's alternatively a dramatic video game, like one of those story-built video games, it should be like the story moves forward. Like you're doing something in a crazy hallway and then you turn around and you're like, Professor, what are you doing here? And the screen goes talk. <laughs> you know, that's interesting. No action happened, but we're all like gasp. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's like, oh, crap. <laughs> Did yeah, we just so die? <laughs> exactly, exactly. It makes it interesting, right? You feel intense. Um, so with video games, what is a good balance of storytelling versus fighting? This is a great thing you can learn. If you feel there's too much fighting going on, try and figure out, okay, what would make this video game better? How much more storytelling would it need to be better? Or vice versa. If you feel that it's just info dumping all over the place and not having enough actual action, Ow. how much less does it need in order to be, have been more beneficial? All right. Info dumping bad. No yes. No, bad. <laughs> no, bad you do. Um, <laughs> so, one last thing that you can learn from video games is... Unique non-player characters. <laughs> now, this also applies to, obviously, side characters, or not main characters. So, in some ways, not plot characters is what I would change that to. Lol. <laughs> it works both ways. But anyway, so non-player characters are not plot pivotal characters. Um, your NPCs are incredibly important to your universe. They help build your universe and fill it out and make it feel real, right? But at the same time, if your NPCs are just saying, like, I like cheese, that's not going to help us. <laughs> However, if your person is like, I need cheese because it's the only thing to cure my magical animal, then you're like, oh, I'm invested now. <laughs> I'm intrigued. Also, why is cheese the only thing that can cure their magical animal? <laughs> like, you're intrigued. It's interesting. It's unique. Um, <clears throat> so with unique NPCs, you got to make sure that they have their own personality. They have their own backstory. They have a well-rounded character plot all of themselves, even if you don't see any of it. Now, does that mean you need to have a massive character bubble where you know all these things? Not necessarily. However, it would be nice if you at least knew five basic facts about any character that is pivotal to your plot, but not a main character. I would say at least five. That will help them feel more well-rounded, even if they're not a main character. Yeah. All right. But honestly, if you're bored at home and don't know what to write, pull out your character bible and just go to town, man. Fair. Fair. <laughs> all right. So that being said, are there any questions about today's topic or writing in general, or should we just move into free write time? Just that. I'm good. I have ranted enough for this. <laughs> You're like, I, I think I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so today's, um, not today's, this month for the teens, the prompt is, since I have a monthly prompt every month, 
is write about someone's lucky day. Ooh. It doesn't necessarily have to be like perfect. It doesn't necessarily have to be fantasy or mystery. It can be any genre, any main character, as long as it is their lucky day. And for some reason, their luck has changed for the better. And what does that look like? All right. Food for thought. It has to be for the better. Well, I did say good, good luck, so it has to be um, for yeah. better. Yeah, <laughs> unlucky. Yeah, if it was unlucky, Part then it'd be really different. Want but to write an unlucky <laughs> where they just everything sucks. But that's like <laughs> most of my story. <laughs> You're just like so. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, food for thought today. I would say uh, my challenge for the week is because I'm going to try to do more of this. I may forget though. My challenge for this week is for you to either read a book and analyze why you dislike it or like it, or do any of the other things we listed, movie, TV, show, play, video game, etc. And again, write down your top five things that you learned from it about what to do and what not to do in writing. Okay, I'm gonna turn off the video now.